you know, some churches I preach in. I preached in three churches last week, uh, one in, uh, two of them in North Carolina and one in West Virginia. And I appreciate any opportunity that I get to preach, but sometimes churches will put you in a hotel called the La Quinta Inn. How many of you know what the La Quinta Inn is? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And y'all know what that stands for in English, don't you? Behind Denny's, right? Behind Denny's. If you ever see a La Quinta Inn, you'll see that it's behind Denny's. And uh, so uh, that's where, but I'm not in a La Quinta Inn. I'm in a, I'm in a nice uh, Holiday Inn Express. So I'm very thankful for the opportunity there. 1 Kings chapter 17. And I just want to read to you a few verses here uh, this evening. I'll get right to, the, right to the chase here. The Bible says in verse number 8, let's pick up verse number 8, 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 8. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. And behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose, and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little, cr and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that I may eat it. And die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make uh, thee for me and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he in her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to preach behind this sacred desk. And Lord, I thank you that we had a good day today with the, with the teens. And uh, Lord, just traveling, getting here safety. And Lord, I, I know where I stand tonight. I stand in a great church. And Lord, I, I thank you for this wonderful, faithful man and these people to come out on a Wednesday night. Lord, many of them has worked all day and they're tired. And uh, Lord, we, we really just want to hear from you. We're not here to see a man. Uh, uh, many of these people, I have no idea who they are. They don't know who I am. And Lord, uh, if we just came here to, to fill some space, it wouldn't be, uh, really wouldn't accomplish much. But Lord, we know all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Lord, I pray for these few minutes that, Lord, someone will get help. I, I'm not just preaching to teens tonight. Matter of fact, I may be preaching a little bit more to their parents and to the youth workers tonight than the teens. Lord, I pray that we can do some things, as we see in this text, that will help us reach another generation. Lord, I love you. I thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I couldn't help but be here for just a little bit today and uh, walk around the property. Brother Andrew took me around this beautiful complex right here, and then he took me over to the school where we obviously had the revival, and I walked around that beautiful building there. I couldn't help but uh, look at all the kids. I, there was kids everywhere. Y'all have a slew of kids around here and teens, and, and uh, I always say this about churches with, uh, with, with no children. Uh, they're dying churches. I've preached in churches before where it was just mostly an older congregation and very little kids. Matter of fact, I had a church a pastor one time tell me years ago, uh, yeah, we let all the young families go to the church across town so they don't mess our facilities up. And I thought, my goodness alive, that's not a very ministry-minded uh, church. You know, I, I love children and I love teenagers and I love preaching to teens. I've spent a lot of my adult life preaching to young people. But as I read this text here in 1 Kings 17... I could not help but think about what is going on in the life of Elijah. And, and here he is by the brook Cherith. And I, I, I uh, believe that he's been put there obviously for a reason. And, and he's, he's been fed by the, uh, by the ravens. He's been drinking by the brook. And, and, and God commanded him to go by this brook. God commanded Elijah to be by there. And then God also tells him at the end of those three years, uh, these years by this, this brook, uh, that he will get up and he will go to a place in verse number 9 uh, to Zarephath. 
There's a widow woman that he has sustained there. He's, he's told this woman to, to, uh, uh, to take care of the prophet, even though uh, it, you read on in this text, it, it kind of seems like the woman has no idea that Elijah's coming. So I've never kind of wrapped my mind around that. But, but Elijah's told there, God says, there's a widow woman and she's going to take care of you. And, uh, and she's going to sustain you. Now, what, what's the reason for this? Well, there's been a famine in the land. See, Israel is under judgment. If you read 1 Kings chapter 17 and 16, and you can know there's a drought. And, and then if you go on to 1 Kings chapter 18, and you read uh, that there is, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, all these prophets and all these uh, uh, bell worshipers and all these different ones, and, and God's judging this nation of Israel for their idolatry. Uh, some would look at what Elijah is about to do and they would say, Elijah, why would you waste your time going to this town to, 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 to be here with this widow woman? If you notice, this widow woman, she is there and she's gathering sticks. And if you go back to the text, she's, she's uh, gathering up sticks and she's got a little cruise or a little jar of oil and she's got these sticks together. and She's going to make some cake, if you will, and make, some, uh, uh, make a little meal. And at the end of that meal, that's going to be the last meal that they have and then they're going to die. That's what she said. Well, I want you to look on in verse number 18 and uh, or, or verse number 17, it came to pass these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, now this is the same woman, what have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? So as soon as the boy gets sick, the, the widow woman's son, as soon as the prophet shows up, the boy gets sick. Now, there was a miracle that happened before that. Hey, we know that Elijah says, Ma'am, if you would go and just make me a meal first, God's going to supply your need if you'll just obey what I ask you. And the woman actually does what the prophet says. She goes and she starts making the meal for the prophet, and then all of a sudden there's still oil in the, in the cruise, and she still has enough meal in the barrel, and it wasted not. What a miracle. But right after that miracle, the boy of this widow gets sick. And there's no breath left in him. He's dead. Notice verse 18. And, Eli and, and she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him into a loft where he abode. And he laid upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon this widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. I see the first thing we come to is I, I just want to challenge you workers tonight, you teachers tonight, you parents tonight, those of you that work with these teens to stretch yourself for the child. To stretch yourself for the child. You say, what do you mean? Well, some would look at what Elijah did here and they would say, uh, that's a worthless ministry. First, Elijah, you're going to a widow. She can't do one thing for you. This nation is under judgment for us. America is not headed for judgment. We're actually under judgment right here. We're under judgment for the same reasons that Israel was under judgment, for idolatry. Hey, we, we, we murder babies and we do all these things against God. Friend, you cannot tell me that our nation is not under judgment. Hey, the same could be said about Elijah and, and about Israel. Uh, they, they were under judgment. There was a drought. And some would look at what Elijah was doing here and they would have said, what a waste. Some churches in this area may look at what you're doing here at Lighthouse Baptist Church and they may say, what a waste. Why would you go uh, three days and have a youth revival and go through all the expense and go through all the things to reach these kids whose nation is under judgment? Could it be that their families are under judgment? See, this woman here is a widow. In the Bible times... A, a woman that's husband had died or is out of the picture, she's, she's almost as if she's cursed. And this woman, I don't know, but it seems like to me that when this woman, uh, this bad thing happens to her, here's what she says. Go back with me in the text. It says, uh, verse 18, 
And she said to him, Elijah, what have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin, to call my sin to remembrance? I don't know what sin she's talking about, but obviously there was something in her life that as soon as her, her boy took his last breath, she recalls that sin that maybe this prophet has come by and God is judging me and he sent this prophet to judge me. Why are you bringing my sin up, prophet? Why are you doing this to me? I love, he was the only thing that I had. Why did you do this? Hey, some would say, hey, why would you reach these kids on them buses? Hey, why would you go out here and have a Sunday school class? Why would you go through the expense of, of, of building another wing on a church and, and paying all that and raising money? Why would you do that when these families can't do one thing? I guarantee if you took the offering up on them kids that ride the bus or, or the kids that come in, the kids that you reach, and you took them off, you couldn't buy yourself a good steak that day. Really? Some would say, what's the use of reaching people? They can't do anything for you. Hey, can I ask you a question? When's the ministry been about getting? When's the ministry ever been about what we get out of these kids? How about the ministry is about giving? Oh, yeah, so Elijah says, you know, it's a, some would have maybe looked at Elijah and thought this was a worthless ministry. This, and then there's another reason why they might have thought this was worthless. Look at it. This woman in verse number 10, when Elijah enters into the city, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. But nowhere in verse number 10 do I see a little boy gathering sticks. Some would say, as I just said, they're not contributing to anything. What's these young people? What's these teens other than their spirit? And they had a, boy, they had a good spirit this morning and, and we had two good services there at the school. But what are teens really going to contribute? What are these kids really going to contribute to the church? Mostly it's the adults. It's the tithes and the offerings and it's the spirit and often the choir and, and running the buses and doing the teaching and doing the preaching. Hey, the kids are just here and many would say, well, well, that's kind of a waste, but not with this story. No. See, some would look at what you're doing here, Lighthouse, and they would say, that's a worthless ministry. That's a waste. It's a waste to fly a guy in and preach a, a meeting to these kids. That's a waste. Well, well, we'll let that church across town do that. We'll let that church in another state do that. But we're not set up for that, so, so, so let's, let's just move on to something else. Well, some would say that might be a worthless ministry. But I want you to notice something. Look at the rest of the story. The Bible says this boy, he dies, and there's no breath left in him. And this woman starts blaming God and blaming the prophet in verse number 18. In verse number 19, he said unto her, Give me thy son. So Elijah, he really don't, I don't really believe Elijah expected that to happen. Elijah looks at the, 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 the widow woman, the, the mother of this boy, and, and, and he says, uh, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Now notice what he says in verse 20. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? Elijah's praying. He's like, God, what in the world? I just came here to get some food and be sustained. And all of a sudden, this, this woman's boy dies. God, why did you do that while I'm here? See, we see the seeming worthlessness of this ministry, but I want you to notice the stretching work. Because the word stretch actually means to amplify or to enlarge beyond a natural proper limit. To expand or to fulfill a larger function. Uh, here's what Elijah does when this boy, he, he, uh, uh, this boy dies and Elijah picks him up. He carries him up into a loft or his, where he's been staying and he lays this boy on this cot or this bed and notice what he does. He prays unto the Lord and then verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him. Again, Elijah stretched himself three times. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, we're stretching. 
that's the whole, really the whole gist of the message is stretching for the child. Going beyond. Hey, I, 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 I stretched one time, preacher, stretch again. I stretched a, a second time, preacher, stretch again. Elijah, the first time that it took place, he, he might have stretched himself, nothing happened. The second time he stretched himself, nothing happened. The third time Elijah stretched himself after he prayed, the boy revived. Now you say, preacher, what's stretching? I think we see that in the text here. The first thing we can do is look what Elijah did by stretching. Verse number 20, He cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? The first thing Elijah did was he prayed. You say, preacher, we only get these kids... Some of them only come to our, our church two hours a week and the world gets them the rest. What difference can we make in the life of a child when we've only had them for two hours and the world has them? Hey, I'll tell you the difference. We can pray for them. Let me ask you a question, church. Look at me. If you're not praying for your child, I wonder who is. Could it be that nobody prays for your child? It, Mama, if you're not praying for that boy that God has given you or that daughter that God, God's given you, maybe nobody's praying for him. Have you ever thought about that? I've got three, I've got three children. My son's bigger than I am. He's 13. He is a hoss. That's what we call him where we're at, hoss. Because he, he's just eating us out of the house. Y'all pray for us. I mean, he's, he is. It, you, just, Mom, I'm hungry. He wakes up like, Mom, I'm hungry. I go to bed. I mean, we're feeding him. It's like a trough in the kitchen. We're just going to put some food out there and let him eat. My daughter, she's 12, going on 13. She's the same way. They're, they're growing. I got a little girl named Colby. Colby is six years old. She's our love child. And uh, we, we love her. We waited a little bit and, and had her. And she's just like the darling of the family, the oldest two. They're like, Mom, she gets away with murder. And you would have never let us do that. And we're like, hey, she's the young. How many of you, you know what I'm talking about, the youngest sibling, you know, they're like, why didn't y'all, were y'all the guinea pigs? We just figured all things out. Here, y'all know what I'm talking about. And uh, I was the oldest in my family, and my youngest, which is Leah, she lives in Michigan, uh, she, she just got away with murder. And I'm like, Dad, you know you would have killed me for that. And uh, anyway, so I, you can tell I'm, I'm, I'm harboring some bitterness there too as well. And uh, y'all pray for me there. But, you know, uh, you think about, I've got three children. Man, I, I was thinking about praying for my son. I was praying. My, dad, my son's playing football right now. And my, in practices, he starts school Monday. And my daughter starts school Monday. And I was praying for them even in the, even in the uh, uh, airport today early when I was sitting there and there was really nobody around. And I was just thinking, Lord, I, I want my son to turn out for God. I want him to be hungry for God. I was watching him last night on the front row, 14 years old. And he had his little pad out taking notes from the preacher. And I'm like, Lord, don't ever let that go away in his heart. Lord, uh, please let his heart be tender. I want my daughter to be tender for God. Hey, I want them to turn out. Mom and dad, we ought to fervently pray for our children. Fervently. Hey, we ought to pray for these teens. So anyone can pray, by the way. Here's the deal. Those of you that have lived your life, you're in those retirement years. You say, preacher, I just can't work with youth. I'm not able. Can you pray? We can pray through. The second thing that Elijah did, notice what else he did when he stretched himself. Notice what else he did here in verse number, uh, verse number 19. He, he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Here's what else he did. He prayed and then he picked him up. Now I know... We, we have a no-touch policy at our church. I'm not talking about literally picking up a kid. I'm talking about encouraging a child. Encouraging. Think about this. There's kids that we pick up on Sunday. We have two buses and a van. There's kids that we pick up on Sunday that the only smiles they may see in the week are the ones at church. The only love they hear is the ones they hear at church. Hey, the, the, the greeting that we get, the, the man that greets the people at the door, he may say, I'm so glad that you're here. That may be the first time those kids hear, I'm glad that you're here. Can you encourage somebody? 
These kids need encouragement. I, uh, I used to pick up a girl by the name of Kayla. Kayla, was, uh, Kayla Bryant was on our bus route uh, well, back when I was a bus captain and a youth pastor and all that back years ago. And Kayla was the worst kid I've ever picked up in my life. I was afraid of her. She was bigger than me. She, she was tall, big, just... Man, she was, you know, stout. I was afraid of her. Like, she made threats to all the workers. And uh, she would, we would be preaching in some of the teen classes, and all of a sudden she'd have outbursts, someone make her mad. And we would have to say, hey, you know, take her out, do whatever, you know, deal with her, take her home. It got so bad that we just we started losing good kids. So one, uh, one, one, one Sunday, this is years ago, I said, we cannot bring her back. We're losing good kids. It broke my heart. Boy, she was so disrespectful, hateful. She had terrible language. And I knew what she lived in, so I, I kept giving her the benefit of the doubt. Finally, we just couldn't handle it anymore. We wasn't set up for it. So I had to dismiss her. One year, I, I didn't see her. I didn't, we didn't go by her house because we knew it was just going to be... And I'm driving the bus on a Wednesday afternoon picking up teenagers from our visitation. We had about 40 teenagers in the community, and I'm making my rounds, picking them up, little groups and different things. And I round the corner, and there is Kayla standing on the edge of the corner. And she's flagging the church bus down, and I act like I didn't see her. I'm like, what is, who's that over there? Man, I don't recognize that girl. Oh, it's Kayla. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, good to see you. And I'm thinking, not really, you know. She's mean. Y'all don't realize how mean some of you are like, how could you be that way? If she was here, you would understand. She was a mean, mean chap. So uh, she, uh, she, she was uh, something else. Anyway, her and her entourage, she had some cousins that was in on it too. So she's flagging the church bus down. One year later, I open up the door and I say, Kayla, it's so good to see you. And I'm like, oh, my, that's not good. <laughs> and so on the edge of the corner, she said, preacher, she said, I miss the church. And I said, well, we, we miss you too. <laughs> Woo, <laughs> Man, on the church bus. This ain't the church. It's just the bus. So I'm, uh, We miss you too, Kayla. And I'm just thinking, man, I'm so glad. Because everything was so smooth. There was no problems. We didn't have to have extra workers. Nobody was leaving because of the mean girl. And here's what she said to me. Preacher, would you give me another chance? And I wanted to say, no, you had your chances. Would you give me another chance? And I said, Kayla... I don't know. And she, I said, last time you were here, it was bad. She said, I know, but I've changed. Would you pick me up Sunday? I said, Kayla, I'm going to give you a chance. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to be by here such and such time. And, and she said, well, I'm going to get my cousins. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> don't tell them. It's like the Jesse James gang. You know, don't tell them. And uh, uh, sure enough, all of them were there Sunday morning. And they got on the bus. And honestly, Kayla... She must have talked to them on the, on, on the, before we got there because they were all just good. And Kayla sat there, and I, I'm looking at them like, man, I'm waiting for the eruption. It never happened. She went all through teen service. never happened. Took her home. She did great. The next Sunday, picked her up. She did the same thing. Wonderful. And we just started picking her up. I'm thinking, man, something has happened to that girl. Well, that was about December. We have a big youth meeting in April. We did back, back years ago. And, and, and I said, listen, we're going to give away this big prize. I think back then it was an iPad. They had just really kind of gotten going. I said, we're going to give a, a brand new iPad for the person that brings the most teen visitor, first time teen visitor. On, uh, we had a Thursday night or Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night youth meeting. And Kayla brought 21 first time visitors the first night. She called me and said, Pastor, I need a bus. And I said, Kayla, what do you need a bus for? She said, I've got 21 on the street corner. Out of those 21 that came, 10 of them got saved the first night. 10 young people. She's back there just bawling. And boy, just, I, was, I was so encouraged by what God was doing. The second night, she brought a few more. Uh, uh, Thursday night. On Friday night, she, she brought some, but, but I was watching during the invitation, and here come Kayla, and she came down here, she was crying with some of her friends, and I thought maybe she was just emotional because her friends were getting saved and getting help, and I said, Kayla, what are you down here for? And she said, I've come to get saved. And man, she got saved that night. It was unbelievable. If you thought she was going 100 mile an hour for God, she kicked it in overdrive. 
That girl, listen, she lived in the worst conditions I've ever seen anybody live in. There was no furniture in this house. It was only mattresses, cardboard boxes. There was a different man there every Saturday that I would go by. There was often syringes and needles and beer cans and things in the yard. And this girl would walk over those things, often her mother cussing her out the door, and she would get on a bus and give it everything she's got. She, listen, I was preaching in South Carolina. I had to leave that church. Uh, God moved me to South Carolina about three and a half years ago. I was preaching one Sunday night through the back doors. Walk Kayla. She's now grown. She had her driver's license. She's in her third year of college. And she said, Preacher, I was missing you so bad today that I had to drive three hours tonight to see you and hear you preach. Hey, she's finishing up college, got her own place, serving God, still faithful to church. You say, what do you mean? A little encouragement? A little prayer? A little going after somebody? One, if it was all it ever took was just to reach one young lady, it'd be worth it all. You say, what else do we need to do? And I'm hastening. Not only did they pick these children up and encourage them, not only did they pray through for them, but they pressed on. The Bible says, look at it in verse number 21. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. The first time he stretched, sounds like to me nothing happened. The second time he stretched, it sounds like to me nothing happened. The third time, life came in to this boy. Have you ever wanted to give up? You ever wanted to quit? You ever been working with young people and you just thought, ah, I'm just not getting anywhere with them? You know, I, I, I was a youth pastor for 12 years. Um, and in those 12 years, there was times where I thought, man, the first four or five years were pretty rough, actually. And there was times where I thought, you know what, this is not working out. Matter of fact, uh, the first time I was a youth pastor, years and years ago, the first Sunday, I had a kid walk up to me and says, you're never going to be my youth pastor. So-and-so is my youth pastor. I'm like, well, I love you too. I'm like, what did I just get into? You'll, they'll hurt you sometimes. But guess what? Can I just challenge you moms and dads and you, you, you Sunday school teachers and you youth workers? Keep pressing on. Keep going. Man, I, I was at a church in Indiana not too awfully long ago, and, and I was in the pastor's office, and, and the pastor, uh, we were, I was going to preach for a couple days, and he, he pushed a letter across his desk and said, read this. I picked up the letter. I started reading the letter, and this guy who was a graduate of a college, a Bible college, I was reading this letter, and it said, uh, Dear Pastor, I was just, and he said, it was just kind of going on a little bit, and he said, You know, I, I just think that the children's ministry is just not that important for me to be doing what I'm doing. I, I just feel like that's a little under what I'm able to do. I should be doing more and, instead of working with children, so I'm resigning my position. And I thought to myself, God have mercy. It may be the most important job in the church. Keep pressing on. If you're discouraged tonight, mom, if you're discouraged tonight, hey, grandmother, if you're discouraged tonight, hey, youth worker, if you're discouraged tonight, hey, preacher, if you're discouraged tonight, keep pressing on. It's going to get better. Hey, keep stretching yourself like Elijah did. But the last thing we come to, we see the seeming worthlessness of this ministry maybe in 1 Kings 17. We see the stretching work. But then the last thing we see, the significant wonder, because I love the last part of this chapter. Look at verse 22. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child, and he brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is truth. Here's the significant wonder. I'm Real quick. You're reading the first resurrection in the Bible. The first resurrection in your entire Bible was not a prophet. It was not a king. It was not some famous somebody that we would 
talk that maybe would be our favorite Bible character. No, the first resurrection in the Bible is a child. Isn't that good? The first resurrection in the Bible. You want to know what God thinks about children? The first resurrection in the Bible is a child. But the second thing I believe this significant wonder is this. It had the greater effect on the mother than any other miracle that had happened in 1 Kings 17. Look at verse 24 again. And the woman said, that thou art a man of God and the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. So it wasn't the first miracle that the meal and the oil never wasted. That really didn't affect her. But the second miracle that her child came to life, she said, now by this I know. You want to reach parents in this community? Reach their child. You want, to, you want to get to a, a, a woman? It's still true today. It's still true today in the United States of America. You want to reach a family that has nothing to do with God. You go after their children and you reach their children with the gospel. I'm telling you, you have a greater chance of reaching that family. Hey, look at this woman. It's proof. She said, now by this I know. We have so many families in our church today. We had 85 people. This past Sunday, we had over 400. Three, 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 a little over three years. You say, preacher, a lot of people ask me. I have no idea how it happened. I honestly don't. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I go to churches like this and walk around, and like I was telling Andrew today, I'm like taking notes. I don't know if I, I don't know what happened, but I just woke up, and literally God has blessed this church immensely. But can I tell you why? We started focusing on children. Just out of nowhere. There was no children in our church. If you walked in our, our church three and a half years ago, there was a little closet, and you know what they called the closet? The nursery. There was a little rocking chair in there. When the first time I walked in the nursery, it was rocking by itself. I, was, I would not never go back in there. It was spooky. I told my wife, I said, honey, we can't, we can't. I, and by the way, it I wasn't really rocking by itself. So even though churches are haunted when everybody leaves, you know what I mean? And uh, I lived beside a church all my life. So I, I, mom, dad was like, hey, go over there. I think we left that light on. I said, dad, please don't let me go over there. I don't want to go over there. It's haunted. And it, it really was. Anyway, and, uh, but I remember going in this little closet that they called the nursery. And I would look in there and say, I wouldn't put nobody in there. I wouldn't put my... I would, and so we had to change things and started, doing, started knocking walls out and had nurseries here, had two nurseries. And then we, we have a building on our property that we gutted and roofed and vinyl sided and, and, and spent some money and now it's our nursery building connected to... And we have went through so many phases. But guess what? This past Sunday we had 21 babies in the nursery and the women are like, what are we going to do? I said, we ain't building another building right now. What we're going to do is keep loving these families. Keep stretching ourselves. But here's the, here's the best part about this whole message. I believe this. And, and I just came back from Israel two, two, two or three months ago. Three months ago. The rabbis in the synagogues and the temples, there, they teach that this boy in 1 Kings 17 could have been the prophet Jonah. The prophet Jonah. Now, hold on a second. I was thinking to myself, if this is Jonah, that Elijah... And boy, that makes really good preaching, by the way. I'd like to get to heaven and find out that was actually really true. That would be great. Let's just say it is. We don't know that to be a fact. It's not stated in the Bible. They believe that over there. Let's just say it is. Jonah only seen the greatest revival in the history of the world. He preached to a city, and the whole city turned from their wickedness and came to Christ. You say, why do you say that? We don't know who we're reaching. I look at these kids down here, these teenagers. I can't help but think, what if... I talked to a boy out here in the front just a minute ago, shook his hand. Hey, uh, he said, I, I was in that, I was in that uh, revival last year, and, and I said, well, what are you going to do this year? And he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to Bible college. Do we really know? Do we really know who we're teaching? I mean, when has it just became a, a well, you know, uh, they're just a bunch of students, and I'm just going, hey, get out of the robot mode. 
they're not just a bunch of students. Every one of them has potential to be something great for God. Every one of them. I don't know, but in our church right now, I could be teaching and preaching to... There's, a, there's four teenage boys that sits on the front row every service, other than Wednesday night. We have a Wednesday night teen service. Sunday morning, Sunday night, four teenage boys sit right there on the front row. And they, they hang on to every word. Now, right now, they're in that 7th and 8th grade goofy stage. But they think the preacher is like the, the, the coolest guy in the world. I hope they never, you know, because I am. I mean, I hope they... I hope they understand that. But I mean, they're hanging on to everything and they're just in it and, and they're eating it. And I'm just thinking, I'm looking at these boys, all four of them, and I'm thinking, Lord, could it be that one of these four boys one day that you'll raise them up? Maybe all four of them. One of them go out here and be a pastor. One of them maybe pastor this church. One of them go out here and be a great deacon and a Sunday school teacher and a great father. Hey, let's invest in them. Let's stretch ourselves. Mom and dad, you may be discouraged. Hey, youth worker, you may be discouraged. Let's not give up. Let's pray. Let's encourage. Let's go on. 